Right, let's uh, continue the conversation now on these deadly weather conditions in the Eastern Cape. Joining me for this conversation is Dr. Peter Johnston, a climate scientist at the University of Cape Town. Dr. Johnston, good evening to you and uh, thank you very much for your time. Can we start with why it is that coastal cities, coastal provinces are becoming more and more vulnerable to climate shocks? Yes, I'm very glad you put it like that, climate shocks, because it's not bad weather. There's no such thing as bad weather. Weather is a consequence of what, we, of what goes on in the atmosphere, and it's what we get at a certain place in a certain time. Mm. And just very sadly, um, we only really notice these climate shocks or extreme rainfall conditions when people are affected. In fact, when it happens in an urban area. And so it, while it's, I wouldn't say it's a normal occurrence, I'd say it's not abnormal, and the coastal cities, um, because of the lie of the land and because of the slope, um, especially on the eastern coast, we've got a, a raised coastal um, uh, platform, if you like. The, the rivers run down very fast to the coast. And this means that when the heavy rain happens, um, those rivers get inundated, they, they break their banks and they flood low-lying regions. It is a completely natural event, but it's compounded by human influence. Yeah. Talking about building now the climate resilient cities what is the meaning of this because it, it sounds complicated on the face of it maybe someone like you is able to simplify it for us well it is it is not complicated when you talk about a climate shock this is something that is normally unexpected and it's something with which you can't cope. In other words, <clears throat> heavy rainfall or high temperature or strong winds which affect a region, affect a city, affect the inhabitants and cause massive damage. And that damage can just be property, it can be loss of life, it can be infrastructure, there are a lot of things that can happen. Mm -hmm. But that makes you subject to your vulnerabilities. A vulnerability is a very important word. Vulnerability means if something like this happens, is it going to affect me? Is it going to affect my buildings? Is it going to affect my property? Is it going to affect my family it's, and my livelihood? And once you're vulnerable, depending on where you live, depending on the area, depending on the weather, depending on the different climate shocks that happen. For example, if you live in the path of frequent tropical cyclones, you are vulnerable to those tropical cyclones. Now, the only way to treat vulnerability is to either stop the hazard, and you, and, and you really can't do that. You know, we, we're not addressing climate change. We're going to be looking at more and more of these extreme events in the future. So we can't address that. We have to then address our response to that climate. So we have to make ourselves less vulnerable. And the only way we can do that is by increasing our resilience. Now, resilience is the ability to bounce back after the shock. So if we have very heavy rainfall, building resilience or increasing resilience means that you have in place systems that can get rid of that water very, very quickly. Mm. Now, we can't go around building bigger uh, uh, sewage and bigger channels and bigger stormwater drains everywhere, but we can work on keeping them clear, keeping people aware of the risks that come when those channels are blocked and when floods occur. So let's Resilient cities are saying, let's not build in a floodplain if we can. Let's, let's increase those, those restrictions, if you like, and let's make sure that the waterways are clear. Let's keep them clear. And by doing that, we have to have a very strong maintenance team. We also have to educate the public. Now, it's not just in, 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 in drainage that resilient cities are looking at. They're looking at the way they have trees to create cool areas when it's very, very hot. They're looking at ways of reducing the impacts of these heat waves or droughts or floods or very cold snaps or whatever they are. So they're looking at their vulnerability and saying where and how are we are vulnerability and how can we reduce that vulnerability by increasing our resilience to those shocks. Yeah. Uh, talking about that, what you have just mentioned, uh, Dr. Johnston, I'd like to talk now about um, the tools whether or not the country has tools to help deal with these climate shocks, particularly at a local level. There is something called the Climate Change Resilient Development Strategy Framework. Is that a toolbox to deal with this? It is absolutely a toolbox and you know, a lot of very clever people and, 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 and significant time has gone into producing those toolbox, but it is always dependent on two things. And one is the skills of the people that are in charge of, of implementing that. And the second one is the finances. Now, 
it's very glib to say that, oh, that's never going to happen or that's easy to do because it's a bit of both. Unless there's a financial will and financial commitment to developing that toolbox or, or applying that toolbox or implementing the principles and strategies around that toolbox, mm. it's just not going to happen. And to that, we need skills. So the successful cities are putting smart people in charge, educating those people in terms of the climate change strategies. And those people are saying, well, I can take this on board. I can see the writings on the wall and now I have to implement it. And now because they are either engineers or hydrologists or uh, city planners or something, they understand how to implement that plan and then they can increase the resilience of that city. So it's, a, it's, it's complicated, it's time consuming, it's expensive and it takes skills. That's something that we have. Mm. We just have to make sure that those people and, and, and the supply chain of those, of those skills is unhindered. So people going to university must be encouraged. People going to college, people going taking up careers must be encouraged to do those careers. And then they can be infiltrated or put into municipalities and local government to implement those, those strategies. Final question to you, Dr. Johnston. Food, and when I say food, agriculture – Food and biodiversity, why are these considered key assets of the country and the relationship, therefore, between the climate shocks or climate um, patterns that could affect these? How endangered are these? So that's a very complicated question and impossible to answer in, in 30 seconds or whatever, but let's look at food. Food security isn't really dependent on your on agriculture. It's dependent on you being able to buy or access food, whatever form it is. Many countries don't grow their own food and they purchase all their food and import it. But if you've got agriculture and you've got societies and people who have a livelihood in agriculture, it's very important to maintain that agriculture and maintain the quality of the produce that comes out of there so that you then don't have to import. So those people's jobs are secure. There's an infrastructure that's built around that, whether it's the inputs around agriculture or the processing of foods, the distribution of foods, etc. It's a very, very important industry. And it's very key that you look at those vulnerabilities in the same way and say, right, let's look at maize, for example. There are some areas in the country where in 20 years' time, you're not going to be able to grow maize. So you've got two options. Either people leave agriculture in that area or else they change the kind of crop or the way that they grow things. So agriculture is very susceptible to climate shocks and very susceptible to climate change. Mm -hmm. And that industry has to acknowledge that look at their vulnerabilities and work towards resilience. Now, biodiversity is slightly different because biodiversity is a natural thing. It happens on its own. Yeah. The only thing humans really do is one of two things. First, we mess it up. In other words, we destroy biodiversity. And the second thing that we do is we try and build it up again. So we create national parks, we create legislation, we reduce litter, we introduce um, laws to stop rhino poaching and transport of endangered animals and things like that. But biodiversity in this country is such a huge advantage. We don't even really understand that. We have got this similar biodiversity to the Amazon, Amazon jungle. And in much, many cases, we've got much more of that. And that contributes a large part through tourism to our GDP. And that is a goose that's laying a golden egg that we must be very, very careful of. So if that biodiversity is becoming susceptible, either through climate change, which it is, and there's not a lot we can do about that, except allow that, uh, that, that ecology to evolve naturally and create enough space and create enough opportunities, um, keeping alien vegetation out, managing fires, managing overgrazing, managing the, the, the stocks of different animals and the impacts of tourism and also of other settlements around those natural areas. But they, they, they understandably, everybody wants the benefit of that. Yeah. And we have to try and work around that too. So it is a big challenge. And climate change threatens both agriculture and biodiversity, and we must do two things. The one is we must recognize and understand those changes, and that's where the academics come in. And the second one is many practitioners to respond to those recommendations that the academics make and implement those in society. Dr. Peter Johnston, thank you very much for explaining that to us so well. Yes, you said it was complicated, but I think you've broken it down in digestible uh, terms that we can all understand. All right.